Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the 1211 Podcast. It has been a really long time, and not that anyone's actually out there listening to me, but, you know, for a podcast about discipline, I surely have not been disciplined in uploading. So I am really sorry about that, and it is way too late for me to be recording this. However, I got a wild hair. I was listening to uh, Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year podcast. If you don't know about that, it's available everywhere. Po- podcasts can be streamed, and it's really great. I listen to it uh, on the car when I go to work because I have about a 42-minute commute, and it's a great way to both start and end my day, bookend my day with a little scripture, a little bit of Bible study, and uh, and it's Father Father McDreamy, I mean Father Mike Schmitz. So... Uh, Today we're going to begin with a little bit of a prayer uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together and reflect on your goodness and what makes you good and how much we love you and how much you love us. Often we forget that love and we fail to live up to it. We hurt others. We hurt ourselves. But ultimately, you forgive us, and you welcome us back with open arms when we have gone astray. And we thank you for that. And we pray the prayer that your Son taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, yeah, this pod- so, so this podcast, sure, it's about discipline and fitness and getting healthy and the Christian life. Um, but, you know, that's not what I want to talk about. And ultimately, this is my podcast and I can do whatever I want, damn it. Um, recently, there has been a trend of influential Christians making posts and videos and statements on social media or on other outlets about how they're no longer think that they are Christians anymore. Uh, I know John Glaude, obese to beast, uh, who's, you know, someone I admire, someone who's been really important to me, especially in my own fitness journey and getting fit. And I really admired that he was a Christian. I came out and said that he doesn't know if he's a Christian anymore. And I guess that's better than a lot of these other people. Um, I know one of them was a pretty big Christian singer. He was a relatively recent one. There was another one that was an evangelical pastor that came out and said, hey, I'm not a, I don't think I'm a Christian anymore. And it's, it's really heartbreaking. We need to pray for these people for sure. And and because, you know, ultimately they're just one, you know, one prayer away or, you know, uh, for Catholic, uh, one confession away from, from being back in God's grace or back into accepting God's grace. Because even when you don't want it, you get it. Sorry. Sorry, atheists. Um, yeah, and the main reason that a lot of these people cite is, one, hatred, which is disgusting. There is no place for hatred in any Christian church. Um, yeah, and, but the other one has to do with the problem of evil. If God is so good, why does he allow bad things to happen? And this is something that I've thought about quite a lot, actually. I remember I wrote a, looking back, not very good paper on it for my freshman uh, philosophy course, the, the problem of evil, it's called a, th- uh, and someone's solution to the problem of evil is called a theodicy. And my theodicy has grown and changed a little bit in the uh, years since I was an oh so devout Catholic at my Jesuit institution where I attend school. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a problem calling it a Catholic institution because ultimately. Jesuits aren't the most Catholic. Uh, yeah, I almost joined the Jesuits. We can talk about that in another episode. But, uh, yeah, so I go to a Jesuit institution, not necessarily a Catholic institution. And so my the- my theodicy has grown and changed a little bit in that time. But the primary premise is that uh, uh, God is unchanging. And so what God's will for us in the beginning of time at the creation is I, I'm also I'm not a fundamentalist creationist per se. Uh, I believe that God created the world, but not necessarily. I don't necessarily believe the Bible is the scientific truth to how it was created. I think that we can use study of nature, a tangent. We can talk about that another time. But God's d- desire and will for humanity at creation is the same 
as it is now and always has been the same and always will be the same and was the same throughout the entirety of the Bible as evidenced by all of by the numerous covenants that God made with mankind throughout the Old Testament and in the final fulfilling covenant of uh, Jesus's death on the cross. Uh, so God does not will evil and he doesn't permit necessarily well he does permit evil but for a very good reason and that reason is that uh we freely accepted god's gift of free will and part of accepting god's gift of free will unfortunately is evil evil and but evil is not something that was created by god a lot of people would say well since god created free will that he created evil no god gave us free will with the intent that we would use it for good because God wants us to love him fully. And how can you love someone fully if you don't have the option not to love someone? Now, hear me out here. You're married. You have a spouse, a husband or a wife, uh, whatever. And you, you love that person. You do. You do love that person. But it's not hard for you to love that person because there's no one else for you to love. Now, can you say that your love for that person is pure? If there's nothing that could that could uh, lead you away from that love, or that you could choose to no longer love that person, no, it's not as it's not as pure. And so, by God giving us the option not to love Him, it it makes our love for Him that much more pure, and His love for us that much more pure, because it's freely given and it can be freely accepted it's not forced upon us <laughs> uh forced love is is not love that's uh i wouldn't even say rape but it's not <laughs> forcing yourself forcing your love upon someone is just weird don't do that uh there's a, there are a lot of people that try and make relationships that way and they end up getting dumped uh <clears throat> yeah so you can't force your love upon someone and call it pure it's it's it doesn't work and so god wanted us to have the option to love him and what he did was he gave Adam and Eve free will in saying that you can you can choose to uh, abide in my love and abide in creation for all eternity. Uh, and but the only thing that you have to do is not eat this fruit. If you eat this fruit, then you are you know you have fallen from grace and you have allowed sin to enter the world you have knowledge of good and evil and you can't commit evil if you don't know what evil is so when adam and eve decided to uh eat the fruit basically what they were they were doing was was rejecting rejecting eternity they were rejecting eternal life and choosing sin and suffering and all of that and if you look at the i'm trying to i'll remember what chapter it is as soon as i open my bible I'm Catholic. I don't memorize verses. Oh my gosh, everything is falling. I should really prepare my my crap before I get in into this. So if you look at Genesis, shouldn't be that hard to find. It's like the third chapter. Let's see. Okay, so if you look at Genesis three. And starting at verse 14, it says, The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. This isn't God condemning anyone, actually, and it's not God punishing him. That's what a lot of people believe, is that it, this is God assigning punishment to 
Adam and Eve into all of humanity, but that's not what he's saying. He's mourning the life that they have chosen. He gave them every opportunity to have a life full of peace, free from pain and suffering and evil, and for all eternity. And they rejected that, and he's heartbroken. He's heartbroken that humanity decided to reject him. And so he says, okay, this is what you've chosen. You have knowledge of good and evil, and now you've chosen suffering. So God never willed for us to suffer. He never willed for evil to be done in the world. He, But he wanted us to be able to love him fully and completely. So he gave us the option to, to run from him. You know, that there's that old saying, uh, if you love something, let it go. And if it comes back to you, it was meant to be or whatever. Um, that's exactly what God did to us. He gave us the option to be let go. As much as it, as much as it, hurts him. He, and he wants us to be with him. He gave us the option to go. And so, but God's will never changed. He always willed for us to have eternal life and to be fully joined to him, which is why he gave uh, covenants to Abraham and to, uh, uh, you know, worked through the prophets and through uh, Solomon and David and all of those covenants. And then finally, uh, after humanity failed to live up to every single one, he said, okay, I'm going to become human and enter this world in the most vulnerable way as a baby. And I'm going to fulfill all of these covenants for you so that you, the gates of heaven are opened and that you are, you have the ability to, to join me for eternity and in the fullness of love in heaven. And so that is, so God's will never changed. He always wills for us to be free from pain and suffering and to be with him for eternity. However, because we are fallen, we have to die to get there. Um, unless, you know, Jesus just decides to be like, hey, what's up? As we're uh, all, as you know, anyone who's alive today is still alive. And then, of course, you know, there's, you know, revelation and all that stuff. And I'm not even going to try to explain revelation because I can't because I don't know it that well. Um yeah. And so to kind of bring this together, I think Gregory of, I think it's Gregory of Nyssa has a really great interpretation and theodicy about why, or just kind of, that kind of just explains what evil is. And so imagine it's a bright sunny day and someone with, you know, two completely healthy eyes is walking around. The sun is warm. It's good. It you know gives you a nice tan. It just makes you feel happy, and the 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 light is actually pleasing to the eyes. It it feels good to be out in the sun. Now, imagine that you have a diseased eye. It doesn't say what, but a, you know a diseased eye in some capacity. It no longer feels good to be out in the sun. The sun burns. It hurts your eye. It causes you to blink. It brings tears to your eyes because you're, you're, the, the light is blinding. What changed in that scenario? Did the sun change? No. The sun is putting off the same light that it always did and, you know, will until it burns out in 5 billion years or whatever and expands and swallows the earth whole. That's a terrifying thought. Don't think about that before you go to bed like I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so the sunlight didn't change. What changed was the human condition. One human was healthy, and the other human was diseased. And the diseased human hated the sun. Now, the way this all comes back is the sun is God and God's love. The healthy human is a human that is in a state of grace, or a human that has accepted God into their life and is living in accordance to his will. And the diseased human is a human that still suffers from sin and uh, perpetuates evil in the world. The human being is the thing that changed, not God, because God does not change. God's will for us has always been the same. Yeah. And Thomas Aquinas has some good reasons for permitting evil. Let me grab, go ahead and grab maybe another book here. Uh, this is Practical Theology by Peter Kraft. I'm a big Peter Kraft guy. Um, let's see. I know I've read it in here before. 
let's see. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff in here. Maybe I should just make this a uh, a Peter Kraft podcast. I love that guy. I'm going to be so upset when he dies. He's like 80 years old, so could be sooner than I would I would prefer. Let's see. If not, I can bust open the shorter Summa, where Aquinas talks about evil. Oh, God and evil, 28. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So this is actually uh, from the, uh, the Prima Pars question 49, whatever. Uh, so this is Thomas Aquinas saying, Augustine says that God is not the author of evil because he is not the cause of tending to non-being. The order of the universe requires that there should be some things that can and do sometimes fail. The order of justice requires that penalty should be dealt out to sinners. And so God is the author of evil, which is penalty, but not of the evil, which is fault. So Peter Crave goes on to say there are three kinds of evil the evil of physical imperfection or failure or emotional suffering, for example, death, disease, or depression, B, the evil of punishment or penalty for moral evil, and C, the evil of fault or sin. All three have this in common. They all destroy something good. God is the author of being, not non-being. Therefore, God is not the author of evil, but he allows physical imperfections for the sake of preserving the order of the universe wills the punishment of sins for the sake of preserving justice, and C, allows sin to be chosen for the sake of preserving free will. In all three ways, he is perfectly good and perfectly trustable. Because if God did not allow us to have free will, he would not be good. Because he would be, he would, we wouldn't be able to love him perfectly. So, yeah. I've read another thing from, from Thomas Aquinas that says that, uh, in order to know God, we must know good, and in order to know good, we must know evil. So it's kind of that that dichotomy of like, well, how does something good exist if there's nothing evil? Because ultimately, uh, human understanding is is uh, you know limited to compare and contrast and things like that. So we compare two things we 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 know, and we make statements about the other based upon the other, which is you know. I mean, just think think about it. Man, woman, light, dark, good, evil. Uh, what is a woman? Not a man. What is light? The opposite of darkness. What is darkness? The absence of light. What is evil? The opposite of good. Well, evil is also the absence of good or the absence of God. So, yeah. And so kind of things like... Uh, Let's go into some examples here. So what God wills is natural. And I don't mean that, you know, natural and that because cancer is technically natural. But from a philosophical perspective, cancer is not natural. So someone suffering from cancer is suffering from something that is unnatural because if God willed that people got cancer, he would have left a space for the tumor to grow. Instead, the tumor proliferates and grows and pushes organs out of the way to make room for itself and metastasizes to other parts of the body and wreaks havoc on that human person. If God intended cancer to be there, he would have made room for it, that kind of thing. Um, which a lot, of, a lot of Christians will say about tattoos. If God wanted you to get a tattoo, he would have put it there. And you're, you're correct. If God wanted me to get a tattoo, he would have put it there. However, I don't really think that tattoos are, are a sin. Sure, they're unnatural, but I don't think that's that necessarily makes them a sin. I have a tattoo, so uh, don't judge me too hard. <laughs> but yeah, or uh, it, uh, this is the example example my freshman theology professor used, uh, the, the child getting hit by a car and, and dying, and how oftentimes Christians will say, oh, it was just part of God's plan. He had something better planned. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, that's that's why it's a tragedy. If it was part of God's plan, it would be, you know, 
joyful. <laughs> it would, it would, it would, it would bring some good about the world. Uh, no, it's it's a tragedy. God does not will that children get hit by cars. That's terrible. Uh, God wills that child to to live, you know, to a ripe old age and hopefully forever with Him in heaven. That's what God wills. God does not will that people die and get hit by cars. That's just not how it works. There's another thing from Thomas Aquinas that uh, says that uh, God also permits evil because so since God's time is since God can see all of all of time, all of human time, because he's outside of our time and we are, you know, within time, we are constrained to time, uh, we cannot see the good that comes out of things that are evil. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, the limits of human perception so that God permits evil because good may come of it. And off the top of my head, I can't necessarily think of something that was super evil, um, except for maybe uh, medicine profiting off of illegal and cruel and unusual experiments done by Nazi physicians. I, I, I feel like I read that that happened somewhere. Uh, yeah. So, you know, who knows what good could come of something bad later. And, uh, yeah, I've gone on long enough. It's already, it's after midnight here, and I got to get up and work out in the morning because I'm disciplined like that. Uh, any questions, comments, corrections, concerns can go ahead and be emailed to 1211podcast at gmail.com. That's 1211, all numbers, podcast at gmail.com. And uh, go ahead and follow the podcast on Twitter, the, uh, same same handle, 1211podcast uh, or 1211podcast. Yeah. I uh, Hopefully I won't wait so long before putting up another episode, but uh, yeah. I love you guys. I'm praying for you guys, uh, and I please pray for me. God bless.